Hello, folks. Uh, we're going to get started. My name is uh, welcome to the pesticide reevaluation updates for fruit and vegetables and the Nova Scotia Weed Survey webinar. This part of the getting this is part of the getting into the weed series and I'm Rosalie Gillis Madden, vegetable specialist at Perennia, and I will be the moderator today. There are pesticide points available for this webinar. Offering pesticide points by webinar is a bit of a new format, so there are some important points to note. Firstly, due to high demand related to the coronavirus, Zoom, which is the webinar platform we're using today, uh, the connection is occasionally spotty. So please be patient and bear with us uh, in case things kind of come in and out. Uh, at the end of the session, to confirm attendance, Zoom will give us a printout of who attended the session. This means A, you have to watch it to the end, and B, if you and your buddy are both watching it on the same computer, it will only record that one of you is attending. So please use the link that was sent to your email address so that you get counted as being present. The first presentation will start for a couple of minutes, so uh, you have time to get set up on another computer if you need to. You can also download the Zoom app on your phone and watch it that way. Um, and then lastly, you must submit a copy of your webinar receipt, which details your name and the course number and so forth, uh, when you apply to renew your pesticide certification. This is the final session of our Getting Into the Weeds series that Jen Haverstock and I have been organizing over the winter with support from our horticulture colleagues, Caitlin Congdon, Sarah Wood, and Peter Burgess. We've been trying several different formats in person and multiple, uh, in person and multiple occasions at the same time, several different uh, in-person sessions, webinars only, et cetera. We're just trying things out to see what works best. Um, so far, we've discussed high tunnels, farm profitability, winter greens production, and food safety. All of these past um, sessions have been recorded and are now available on the Perennia YouTube channel, along with several other great resources. If you haven't been to the Perennia YouTube channel yet, just type NS Perennia into the YouTube search bar and it will lead you right there. Today's session will touch on the results of the Nova Scotia Weed Survey and pesticide reevaluations. Um, the NSDA has been conducting a rotating annual weed survey and has so far looked at weed populations in corn, soybean, carrots, onions, and strawberries. Angela Gord is an NSDA plant protection coordinator. She'll start today's session off by taking us through the results from the strawberry, onion, and carrot weed surveys. In the last few years, there have been a string of reevaluations of pesticides, making it hard to keep up with the constantly evolving changes to pest management options. Gavin Graham, New Brunswick Minor Use Coordinator, and Peter Burgess, Perennia Integrated Pest Management Specialist, will discuss how this affects horticulture crops. We will go over some of the recent changes in the last few years, some that are likely to come down the pike in the coming months, and how the process all works. Uh, you can type questions uh, into the question function of Zoom, which should be down at the bottom of your screen. I'll moderate them, and so uh, your mics will be turned off, but I will relay your questions to the speakers. Um, you can also use the chat function. Uh, so Q&A probably works best, but uh, chat will also work if you can't figure out the Q&A. Um, so at the end of the webinar, um, you will be receiving an email survey. Please take the time to complete it as it helps us serve you better. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or want to reach out, um, I encourage you to reach out to Caitlin Congdon because I'm wicked pregnant and she's going to be taking over as vegetable specialist while I'm on maternity leave. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Angela and hopefully she will um, be able to share her presentation. You're coming in all right on your end? It is. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Rosalie. I'm just going to jump uh, right into it if everyone can hear me all right. You sound great. Perfect. Okay. So I'm just going to review the Nova Scotia Weed Survey uh, conducted in 2018 and 2019, as well as just kind of go over some methods, objectives, um, and some data. So prior to 2017, the most recent weed surveys that were co conducted in Nova Scotia 
uh, was in 1999. And these were done in annual field crops. So at the time, barley, oats, corn, and strawberry were surveyed for weeds. Um, so, and that brings us to 2017 when we revamped uh, the weed surveys. So 18 years has passed since that initial survey. Um, and there's been numerous changes in the agriculture industry. Um, so there's been an increase in soybean, corn, apple, and vegetable production. Um, so we thought it was a great time to revive, revive the weed survey. Um, so we added um, apple, carrot, soybean, onions to the survey for the first time. So the Department of Agriculture, Animal and Crop Protection, and Regional Service Divisions initiated the rotating annual weed survey in 2017. Staff members reached out to random sample of growers, which were identified by the farm registry list to identify fields to be surveyed for weeds. Our main objectives of the weed survey is just to establish a baseline of weed populations by crop, um, just to get a better understanding of what weeds are present, um, identify any noxious and new weed introductions, and also to help identify development of herbicide resistance. So the data collected from the weed surveys can be used to assess management practices, also to determine changes in species compositions and densities over time by utilizing surveys in subsequent years. And the data is quite useful in identifying research needs and developing weed management recommendations. So the selection of crops was based on the most common, common grown crops in Nova Scotia. And this table just shows our yearly rotation um, that we identified for weed surveys. So in our first year, we surveyed corn. Second year, we surveyed soybean, carrot, and onions. In our third year, we surveyed strawberry. And we're coming up to our fourth weed survey, fourth year of surveying, and we'll be looking at apple and then potentially pasture or forage fields. Um, for our year five, it's still to be determined, um, but we are thinking possibly another small fruit or a horticulture crop. Um, as horticulture crops are just very diverse, um, we may likely attempt um, various individual crops, but it, it's all dependent on resources and, and as time permits. Okay, just, so just getting on to some survey methods. Um, once the fields were identified, we would then go out, count weeds in 20 quadrats in a field to identify the weeds that remained after all control methods. We would follow an inverted W pattern to obtain an even and thorough coverage of the field. Um, and we would modify this pattern, W pattern, for each field to compensate for irregularities in field shapes and sizes and so on. Um, I'd just like to give a shout out to Julia Leeson, who is a weed biologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon, who's been um, a huge collaborator since day one. So we use 50 by 50 centimeter quadrats, which are open on one end, which are then placed into the crop. Um, and then we, we count the weeds within each quadrat. So once we do our in-field surveys, all the, the data is reviewed, results are compiled. Um, our next step is then to follow up with farmers to complete a questionnaire for each field. Um, and this is to identify field history and current management practices. And in the past, we have had low returns on the surveys, um, which is unfortunate as this does not allow for statistical linkages in practices. Um, and it is noted that all information that is provided back to us is, is quite beneficial. Um, and we know it's a busy time of year that we're kind of uh, asking for, for information and everyone gets lots of surveys, but we don't wanna discourage folks from participating uh, in the weed surveys. Okay. So into the meat, onto, into some data. Um, so this is 
2018 carrot field. So there were 24 carrot fields surveyed in Nova Scotia. Um, and this table highlights some of that data that was collected. So in the highlighted area, I have our 10 most observed weeds in quadrats, in all quadrats um, across the province. And these 10 species are ranked in order. Um, so where common ragweed was the most common species, then wild radish, pigweed, yellow nut sedge, green foxtail, quackgrass, witchgrass, crabgrass species, narrow leaf goldenrod, and oxide daisy. Just a few shots of the weed survey. So on my left, we have um, some pigweed in the, in the front and some milkweed as well. And then it's harder to see on the second picture, but on the right, my right hand side, it's kind of kind of a peppering or scattering throughout the field of ragweed. Okay, so on to onion weed surveys from 2018. Okay, so for onion, there were six, there was only six fields surveyed. Um, and again, I have highlighted the 10 most observed weeds. Um, and it's just of note that with low numbers of sample fields, um, this can give you a really a higher ranking for certain species. So in our 10 ranked species, chokecherry um, was, was our, on the top of the list. However, chokecherry was only found in two out of the six species, but the density was very high in those two, two fields. Our next ranking weeds are pigweed, lamb's quarters, common ragweed, chickweed, perennial sow thistle, Canada fleabane, field pennycress, vetch species, and wild radish. On to strawberry data from 2019. Okay, so there were 30 fields surveyed, strawberry fields surveyed. And however, I haven't been able to get the statistical analysis finalized to date, um, but I did pull um, the most frequent weeds um, that I have noted um, to date. It's not statistically um, analyzed, but these are the nine species that I pulled. And I wanted to compare it to the 1999, um, the last survey in strawberries, the provincial survey. And I thought it was just quite interesting to see the amount of species that are similar um, since the 1999 survey with a few kind of, a few new ones as well. So buttercup, dandelion, groundsel, sheep sorrel, lamb's quarters, and wood sorrel um, were were seen in 1999 and last season. And that is all I have. If there's any questions, feedback, be glad to answer your questions. I'm not seeing any questions coming in over the chat or the question, um, but Angela, you said that you saw choke cherry in an onion field? Several. Yeah. Is that a tree? It is. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it took us a little while to key it out. Um, it kind of had us confused for a while, but the amount of choke cherry, black choke cherry, in it was mainly, no, it was in the rows and within the onions as well. It was ridiculously dense, like it was just a carpet of choke cherry. So we weren't, we, we plan to head back to that field, maybe this season, I hope, um, to, see, to see how things look. And we weren't sure of dispersal, whether it was moving um, from an animal, from birds, or yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, a question came in and they were wondering how the fields were selected. Yeah, so it's just a randomized, um, we get the farm registry list, all registered farms in the province. Um, and then we use a random number generator and we just go through and start calling um, that way. So it's just very random. Some years you may be chosen, other years you may not be. Um, but so 
So this is a, an annual rotating weed survey. So we have a five year rotation. So every fifth year, if we, sh we hope to get back to those, to those folks that we didn't call. Great, thank you. Um, Gavin, do you want to, uh, to take over? Yep, I can just figure stuff out here for a bit. There, hopefully everyone can see that. And we're good. Yep, we can see your presentation. Good to go. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining up today. Uh, bear with me. This is first time webinar here and I've got uh, three kids under seven hiding somewhere in the house here today. So if you hear them join in, uh, just let me know afterwards. But uh, today's presentation, I'm just going to go over uh, kind of the high level reevaluation of pesticides, the, the process uh, from the PMRA perspective, and then get into a little bit of the terminology. And then I'll hand it over to Peter uh, to handle the, the nuts and bolts on, on some of the more active files that you guys are probably more interested in. So I'm just going to give that kind of high level overview of the, the whole uh, process. So basically with uh, pesticide registration in Canada, as you are probably all aware, it's all through uh, the Pest Management Regulatory Agency or PMRA, uh, which is uh, part of, of Health Canada. Uh, basically, they are there to assess and review all the data requirements for any of the pesticides that are registered to be used in Canada uh, through the Pest Control Products Act. Uh, they do this action uh, based on a stringent science-based evaluation that ensures any of the risks that the products may have are acceptable and that the products themselves have value uh, back to the end user as well. Uh, they also have a role to play in sustainable pest management, so making sure that uh, growers are able to use the tools in a sustainable manner. And then the final one that will be the focus of the presentation today is the reevaluation of pesticides currently on the market on a 15 year cycle to ensure that they meet the current uh, scientific standards. So this science-based risk assessment is uh, really broken down to, uh, into three different parts. Uh, there's a health assessment, uh, so that examines all sources and amounts of potential exposure to a given pesticide. And then the human health risk assessment that determines the toxicity in relation to that uh, level of exposure. Uh, the second component is an environmental risk assessment. So that considers the risks of the products when they get out into the environment, you know, plants, birds, mammals, aquatic organisms, and then the fate in the environment. So that's another section of the review. And then the third section of the review is the value. Uh, so that says the, how the product works and the efficacy of the, uh, of the product uh, being uh, assessed. So uh, as part of that reevaluation process or the RVD uh, process, all the products that are registered through uh, the PMRA are reviewed on a 15 year cycle. So they take the, uh, the products that were registered uh, back 15 years ago or even longer, uh, depending on the, the workload, uh, but they use today's health and environmental uh, protection standards and apply those new processes and new ways of thinking to that, that older chemistry to make sure that the pesticide is still showing that health environment and value uh, benefit back to the growers. Uh, there is a process uh, called a special review uh, that can initiate this review process earlier, uh, but for the simplicity of the, today's talk, I'm not gonna get into the, the special review uh, process. So basically uh, for, for a uh, pesticide review, uh, it's a typically a two document process is the best way to think about it currently. Uh, so basically when a chemical starts the process, uh, PMRA looks at the information that they have in house, in hand, and uh, evaluates the, the health and safety and value of the product based on current standards. And they come out with a proposal 
Uh, so a proposed reevaluation decision or PRVD document. So that's the first step uh, to the reevaluation process. After this document is put out, uh, they allow uh, a comment period. So uh, general public or anyone uh, that's involved can uh, read the document and provide their input uh, towards it. Uh, they take these comments, review them, analyze them, uh, maybe come to some different decisions or come to some different thinkings about uh, what was mentioned. And then they come out with a final, uh, so a final review document or an RVD decision. So this would be the final decision that's going to be implemented into the, uh, the process for the reevaluation. So basically you need to think of it as uh, the start with a proposed document, comments, review, analysis, and then the final decision. And it's the final decision that's the, the final word on it, and that's the decision that's going to be made on the, the given product. So as you might imagine, this, this process uh, can be uh, a little more difficult. It, it can take some time to, to do it, but there are some outcomes that may happen as, uh, as a result of this. So the first one, uh, which can happen, is that there's no changes to registration. Uh, PMRA looks at the, the new information that's provided and they say, yep, the science is still sound. The science we did 15 years ago still holds and everything uh, just remains the same. Uh, it's rare, but it can happen. Uh, what usually happens is some minor or moderate changes to the labels or, or the use directions for those different products. Most of the time it's uh, amendments to deal with buffer zones or re-entry intervals or pre-harvest intervals. Uh, those were uh, more relatively newer uh, pesticide uh, use directions. Uh, so some of the older labels may not have that information. They may look at modifying existing MRLs or maximum residue limits uh, to, to make sure that they're still in line. Uh, they may eliminate or phase out different formulations of the product. So uh, you typically see this with dust type formulations, you know, powders that, you know, have a lot more potential for human health contact. Uh, so there, there may be some revisions there. Uh, with these minor to moderate changes, it tends to be uh, within a shorter time frame, so a two-year window. And this and this process can be a little bit less structured as as the as a third one I'll discuss below. Uh, the time frames here are a lot more driven by the registrant. Uh, so they they're the the owner of the the chemical. They can decide when to implement these changes, but they usually have a two-year window to to get it done. Uh, but sometimes they do that earlier in that process. Uh, the, the third option is the complete removal of a product registration, and that's usually the one that, can, that has the most concerns for, for growers. Uh, with this process, they look at the, the health and environmental uh, triggers, uh, and there's an issue that can't be dealt with through label changes or process changes to, to the application method. And within this process, this is a, a more of a detailed, structured three-year phase-out period where it's much more stepwise of you have uh, one year to, to sell to retailers, retailers have one year to sell to, to growers, and growers have an extra year to, to use a product. So a three-year uh, phase-out, which is much more structured than some of those minor to moderate changes. So, so just to keep in mind that there are three different outcomes, we tend to focus in on that third you know, removal. Uh, but there are lots of products that go through the system, the reevaluation system, and have uh, minor to, to no changes to the registration. So I did mention the, the opportunity to provide input uh, earlier in the, in the uh, consultation process, and that's really uh, where the grower's voice and our industry's voice can be heard. Uh, it is really important to take advantage of that proposed reevaluation decision uh, opportunity. Uh, and to submit the comments back to PMRA. Uh, just to outline the use pattern that's uh, being used for the products, the importance of the product, ways being used, ways to mitigate risks. And that really helps inform their decisions and let them know what kind of options may be available in that final decision uh, process uh, that's there. The other way to provide input is to make sure that we're giving accurate use information back to the PMRA. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, they're using models and, uh, and uh, math to, to drive these decisions. 
And if they are using just the, the label as written, uh, the, the actual use in field can be a little bit different than what is, is uh, stated on the label sometimes. Uh, it's usually uh, smaller windows or uh, less uses, those kinds of things. And it helps that, to give them an understanding of the real world use of the, the herbicide or the, the pesticide in question. Uh, the other uh, thing to keep in mind, uh, they haven't been doing it recently, but they were offering transition strategies. So looking to, to help bridge away when you're losing a product, trying to bridge to other products. So to take advantage of those opportunities whenever they come up. Uh, and then the other thing I'll mention now is that uh, PMRA is, is going through a process to kind of uh, to change the entire reevaluation uh, framework. Uh, so that's, that process is, is going to be continuing. So just to keep that in mind that uh, things may be changing for the whole process uh, down the road. So if you are looking to submit some information on the specific uh, uh, proposed decisions of, of interest. Uh, on the PMRA site, uh, they do have the, uh, the ways that you can uh, put in the, uh, the content or, or, or pass the information along to them. Uh, there is an online form that is available that you can uh, enter in the information and, and to uh, send that in. Uh, uh, but if you are doing that online version, just to make sure that you're including the, the document number that you're looking to make comments on, just to help close the loop. Uh, but uh, for me personally, whenever I'm making comments on behalf of growers, I'm usually sending them in via email. Uh, uh, just an email letter is, is usually how I'm sending it in. Uh, the deadlines uh, can change and they do vary based on when the decision was made. Uh, so just, that's the other thing to keep in mind is just to watch the, uh, the deadlines as they're posted on the consultation page to make sure that your, your information is getting uh, back into the PMRA at the right time so that they can still action it. Uh, the other thing that you may want to keep in mind is that uh, the PMRA does uh, uh, present their reevaluation and special review work plan uh, annually. It's usually uh, about March, April time. So, you know, I would be expecting to see something in the, in the near future for the 2020 year. Uh, but basically, it outlines their five year plan uh, as a re uh, in regards to reevaluation and special review. So, this gives you a bit of a, a roadmap of, of what the process may look like and what kind of uh, products are in the pipeline uh, for PMRA to, to have some consideration. So I just pulled a couple of the uh, tables that are in that document, but basically it just outlines which products are in the queue and when they expect to have those decisions out. Uh, they, these timelines can be adjusted and they do, uh, they do move a little bit. They are a little bit fluid, but it gives you a bit of a sense of when to expect some of the, that information to come in and to help uh, prepare uh, before that's, those uh, decisions come out. And then they also have the newer reevaluations to be initiated uh, listed later on in the document. So it gives you a, a roadmap of in three years time or five years time, what products they expect are gonna be entering into that 15 year window uh, that will be uh, put out for consultation. So I'll just uh, make another point about uh, when these reevaluations occur, uh, there can be lots of subtle changes to the labels. Uh, there can be adjustments made and it, it can be hard to keep track of them. Uh, one tool that I, I use quite a bit to try to help keep track of this kind of information is the uh, PMRL, PMRA label search or else the label application that they have available as well too. Uh, I typically use the, the online version. Uh, you can go through search, find the label uh, of interest for you, and then uh, use a control F or use the search functionality of the PDF. Uh, that search functionality, uh, it can be very powerful to help you try to find the information that you're looking for. Sometimes those labels are very long, very large documents and very hard to find exactly what you're looking for. And the control left search functionality of that PDF document just helps you zero in on, on some things of interest, you know, your crop of interest, your re-entry interval, pre-harvest interval, those kinds of things that, that may have been shifted. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention about the labels that are on the PMRA site is if you look at the first page on the top left-hand corner of the label, there's two numbers that appear. Uh, the first number is associated with the last 
uh, PMRA document or PMRA uh, submission that made a change to that label. So that, that would be that top number of the example at the bottom of the page there. The second number is the date that uh, label change was implemented. So it gives you a quick way to look at a label and say, how recent is it? Have they made a change recently? Or is this still the same label that I used from last year or two years ago? They haven't made any changes. It gives you a little bit of confidence on uh, if you really need to dig in and, and have a closer look at that label or if, or if things are gonna hold up uh, because it's the same document that you have been using for a few years now. I mentioned it uh, a little bit earlier about the uh, consultation and reevaluation uh, changes. So they are, PMRA is proposing uh, some changes to this whole system. Uh, the, the, uh, the consultation process around this whole change to the reevaluation uh, program uh, was supposed to be occurring uh, in March. And as you may expect, some other things in the world happened and uh, things have been delayed a little bit there. Uh, so I'll just mention that they, they will be coming back out uh, to try to consult uh, with, uh, with the region and, and uh, growers that uh, may have some opinions on this. So just to keep in mind that if it's something that you're interested in following up on, just uh, shoot me an email sometime and I can get, make sure you, you get on the list of, as far as the consultation list for, for the future changes. So with that, I can take a bit of a pause now uh, and try to address any questions you may have had on the whole PMRA side of the equation. Uh, and I'll just scroll up and see if there was anything that popped up in the, in the chats. But if there isn't anything pressing, I, I do have a little bit more material to cover. I'm not. Um, there's a question here in one of the chats, Gavin. Do you know what the reason is for not putting the reevaluation documents online? Uh, the reevaluation documents, uh, they, anything that uh, the PMRA is putting out for the proposed decisions and uh, the final decisions, they should be on the, the website. Uh, the consultation documents, they were just starting that consultation process. So if you're talking about the proposed changes to the whole process, uh, I'd expect some more information to come on that later. Uh, but I think they were starting the, the first look at that, uh, that process. So there may be some more information to come. Does that answer your question, David? We'll assume yes. If uh, there's no other questions, I'll move on to uh, the terminology section or what I'll call alphabet soup. Uh, it, there is a lot of terminology that floats around, uh, especially within the reevaluation process. Uh, like you probably saw that I was tossing around the acronyms uh, quite freely. So I just wanted to make sure that we take a step back and make sure that we're all talking about the same uh, things. Uh, so the first one I'll go over is restricted entry interval. Uh, so the restricted entry interval is the amount of time uh, that needs to pass after a pesticide application uh, before you can access that treatment area. So it's the amount uh, of restriction on the period of time that you're allowed to access that field uh, after an application. Uh, this allows for the product to degrade or to break down to levels that don't, do not pose a threat uh, to, to the you know, human health. Uh, so this re-entry interval is required when uh, or the restricted entry interval is required when the provincial daily exposure to the pesticide residues are expected to be above uh, what a level that is deemed safe. Typically, uh, on, under most uh, product applications now, you're seeing a 12-hour re restricted entry interval, uh, but it, there can be some differences based on the product types. So these, these uh, periods are a function of the amount of residue uh, that remains on the, the plant surface or or the, the amount of product that actually stays on the surface of the plant, the amount of treated plant surface that's gonna be coming in contact with a worker that's potentially uh, in there in the crop doing some of these jobs, and then that duration of the exposure. So if you're only in for a short period of time, uh, the, the uh, amount of risk is, is less. Uh, the reentry interval can range from several hours to a few days to, to even longer, depending on, on some of the activities. And it can vary based on the work that is to be done in the field. Uh, so if, 
there can be a different restrict uh, different entry interval for different types of tasks. And it's uh, ultimately up to the grower to notify any workers that are going to be entering into that period, uh, just to, to make sure that they're aware of, of the restricted entry interval and that they're respecting that restricted entry interval. Uh, so this is just an example of, of uh, one of the labels that I, I pulled, uh, just showing that the restricted entry interval can be different based on the crop uh, that you're growing. So to make sure that, uh, that they are very crop specific, so that you uh, aren't following the same one for, for every crop. And it can get pretty complicated uh, depending on the risk of the product and the, uh, the amount of residues that may be remaining. So it is very important to refer back to the label and uh, follow those directions uh, that are outlined there. The next one I'll quickly cover is maximum residue limit or MRL. Uh, so this is an acceptable level of pesticide in a harvested crop. Are, so this is the amount of pesticide that is, is going to remain in that harvested crop that is still deemed to be safe uh, for, for con consumption. Uh, these uh, limits are established to ensure that the total pesticide residues absorbed during your daily food consumption is not going to exceed a, a threshold level of safety. And this is, uh, is based on chemical properties of the product and on the dietary patterns uh, of consumption as well too. So both those things are taken into account. Uh, MRLs are, are much more of a country to country driven process. So every country sets uh, different levels and this can uh, impact trade and uh, make, makes things a little bit more difficult uh, from, from that side of the business. Uh, when it comes to the maximum residual limits or MRLs, I always recommend that growers uh, deal with their processor uh, or their buyer to make sure that they are following the, the rules that are applicable or the, uh, the rules that are gonna allow them accessing to, to different markets. Some processors will say no to certain products that are still approved by Health Canada, still approved through the PMRA, uh, but if they are not able to be exported into other markets, then uh, processors uh, may limit their use that way. The uh, second to last uh, acronym I'll go over is pre-harvest interval. Uh, so a pre-harvest interval is a period of time uh, after a pesticide application to allow those pesticide residues to break down to an acceptable level so that to help uh, manage the amount of, of product that's left in a, in a harvested crop at harvest. Uh, as you may expect, uh, this is a function of the pesticide use pattern. So this is when you're using the product and then the residue that's allowed at that crop at harvest, so that maximum residue limit. So those two things are, are interlinked. The pre-harvest interval can vary widely uh, between uses, uh, different crops, different rates, different timings. So this is another one that you do need to, to verify the crop that you're growing and make sure that you're following the pre-harvest interval for that crop. And it's usually based on dose or timing decline trials uh, that the company or the registrant is preparing. So this is just another example of a label outlining the differences in pre-harvest interval that can be there. Uh, you can see that some products or some commodities look to be very similar, but they can have different pre-harvest intervals. And it's all based on what science was available for the crops that, they're, that they were tested on. So as far as the pre-harvest interval and maximum residue limits, uh, the numbers are usually formula based on product properties. Uh, some assumptions are put in there, and then the use pattern uh, really drives the whole process. Uh, these formulas can vary depending on the product and the risks. And if there's specific product information available, PMRA would use that information. Uh, but if there's no information on the specific product available, they will go to default values. So that's where some differences come into to play. Uh, they run the formulas and then compare back to that health uh, evaluation number and see if the risk is acceptable. And if it's not, then you, they may have to change the, the use pattern or the number of uses or the timing of applications to make everything uh, work out. There is a bit of a back and forth and an interrelation between the pre-harvest interval and MRL. Uh, so there is some flexibility there, but that's usually occurring at the registrant level. And then uh, the one thing that uh, is common theme throughout the industry now is they are working toward more global registrations more harmonized maximum residue limits, so trying to, to keep the playing field similar uh, across all the different commodities. And the final uh, 
uh, definition I'll go over for you today, and it's a relatively new one for most, I would say, uh, is vegetative filter strips or v, uh, v, VFS. Uh, this is uh, something that's starting to come onto labels to help address uh, concerns uh, with aquatic runoff or aquatic risks of different pesticides. So this is a tool to help mitigate uh, pesticide runoff into aquatic habitats. Uh, the big one that's uh, showing up now would be for, for Bravo or the chlorothalonil, uh, but there are some other products that uh, this, this terminology is coming on there as well. So basically this is an area between pesticide application and a down gradient body of water to help reduce runoff. And this is different than your typical buffer zone. So I think we're all comfortable with the spray buffer zone of you know, the distance away from the edge of the sensitive habitat uh, from, from a pesticide application. A uh, vegetative filter strip is different than that. Uh, so it, it, it may be smaller, it may be larger, uh, but if both are on the label, both need to be respected. Uh, and the, the image below just shows an example of the difference between uh, aquatic spray buffer zone and a vegetative filter strip uh, uh, on the example uh, down below, and that both would have to apply. Uh, if your surface water is uh, up gradient, you don't have to apply the vegetative filter strip. If it's down gradient, that's the one that has to have the vegetative filter strip, if that's uh, mentioned on the label. Uh, there is some more information on the vegetative filter strip on the uh, Pyramid website, uh, if you wanna dig into it a bit more. Uh, but this is fairly new terminology, uh, and it's something that I think growers are gonna have to be aware of as we move forward with, uh, with some new product registrations. So with that, that's all I have for prepared slides. Uh, if there's any questions, I can take them now, but uh, uh, if you're a little shy, feel free to just send me an email uh, if you want some one-on-one some -on -one questions answered as well too. I'm not seeing any questions coming in, Gavin. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, You'll be on for the rest of the call in case somebody does have a question they think of later. Yeah, no, and I'll, I'll be back up here as well, too, to make sure Peter says everything correctly. <laughs> Perfect. Somebody's got to keep him honest. <laughs> um, all right. Next up is uh, Peter Burgess. Take it away, Pete. Thanks, uh, everybody. Um, Rosie, if you'll indulge me for a little bit here, I've got a, uh, I just got an email from Department of Environment that oh. I think people might be uh, interested in. Uh, it's regarding pesticide licensing for the uh, current year and it's in response to the COVID uh, pandemic and this is for Nova Scotia growers and pesticide applicators. So uh, I'll do the Coles note version but um, renewal of pesticide certification of qualification. So if you need a, if your pesticide certificate expires between December 1st, 2019 and June 30th, 2020, uh, the Department of Environment in Nova Scotia will allow you to operate it under it for an additional year without renewing. Um, we know many certified applicators choose to take education credits rather than write the pesticide exam, but there's been limited opportunity to do that since December, so they're offering this option instead. So essentially, if your license expires in April, it'll, it'll extend it for a year. So that's good news. And they're, uh, for cer first time certificate applications, they're working on an online exam. So you'll be able to hopefully in the near future, and they're gonna send this out that you're gonna actually be able to do an online exam to get your pesticide application for a first time application, uh, first time applicator. So that's good news, I think. That's great, thanks for sharing that, Pete. Okay. So, I don't know how I got stuck with the bad news after that, uh, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the reevaluations that have happened and the significant changes that would happen for some of the products. Um, and there were a significant number of changes over the last couple of years on some fairly base products, depending on the crops that you're growing. So I'm gonna kind of go at a high level on, on some of these different products. I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty on each crop, because some of these labels have significant impact on each crop, but I'm going to recommend uh, places where people can go to look at the, the product labels and see how that could impact their own operation. So 
first one I'm going to talk about is chlorothalonil, uh, the Bravo Echo uh, brand name products. And so effective, um, so the, the major issue, well, there's a couple things that happen with, with chlorothalonil, but effective May 11th, 2020, so essentially this growing season, uh, there are uh, mixing restrictions. Um, so essentially, if you're uh, for all potato acres or applications with more than 340 kgs of active ingredient or are handled in one day, a closed transfer system is required. So I attached a link here on Syngenta.ca has sort of a detail of what that tra closed transfer system might look like. But essentially, it's a way to minimize um, applicator uh, risk on, from the mixing end of things. So I wanted to explain a little bit on what does 340 kgs of active ingredient per hectare, um, or active ingredient uh, in one day, what does that look like? So I went to the Bravo ZN label, and for, for carrot, for example, if you were putting Bravo on your carrot field, uh, the full rate uh, is, there's a range, but the full rate is 3.2 liters per hectare. That equates to 1.6 kgs of active ingredient per hectare. So essentially uh, an individual applicator, if they're applying more than, they're, if they're putting Bravo on more than 212 and a half hectares per day, they would need a closed transfer system. If not, you can use the small jugs and mix in into your tank in, or your pre-mixer or, or whatever system you have. But for some of the larger operations, when you get into uh, perhaps large processing carrot or um, some, uh, some other operations, uh, you, you could have significant impact and may have to change your, how you load the, the pesticide into the sprayer. Uh, there's also other label changes for chlor chlorothalonil. So depending on the crop um, and the use patterns, there's things like additional PPE requirements, particularly for the, um, the uh, person that's doing the mixing and loading or the ap application. Uh, there's uh, defined retreatment intervals, so uh, much more specific on how soon you can retreat uh, with that product. Again, as Gavin just mentioned, the buffered, uh, vegetated buffer strips. And in many crops, there's a revised number of applications that are allowed. Uh, sizes of buffer zones and uh, re-entry intervals for certain activities have changed from the old labels. Um, so the other thing that has changed is discontinued formulations. So the old Bravo 500 and the Ritimo Gold or Bravo Twin Pack are being discontinued. So the last date for sale uh, of those products is May 10th, 2020. So wherever you buy your products, the last day you could buy those products is going to be May 10th of May 10th of this year. Um, important point to note that the last date for use of those products, the Bravo 500 and the Twin Pack, is May 10th of next uh, year. So, you, after May 10th, 2021, uh, you can't can no longer use those products. So, really, it's going to be important for Bravo because it's used on so many different crops and has on many crops has a wide number of applications on different pests. It's, it's gonna have changes on, on different use patterns. So you really do need to look at the label to see how the Bravo ZN is uh, gonna be used. Okay, another deregistered product, um, Metaram, uh, uh, Polyram and Cabriol Plus are two of the products that are gonna be deregistered and their last date for sale is June 21st, uh, 2020, so this coming June. Uh, and the last date for use is June 21st, 2021. So that's from a final decision document. So some of the crops that are gonna be effective, the Cabriol Plus is really only a potato product, uh, but the Polyram had a wider range, potatoes, tomatoes, apples, asparagus, carrot, and grapes. So if you're using those in those uh, cropping systems, it's an important point to realize that after next um, growing, you know, midway through next growing season, you're not gonna be able to use that. And it's hard to say how many of the local suppliers actually even still have that in stock or if they're be able to bring it in. 
Uh, Zyram is the, is the next deregistered product I want to talk a little bit about. It's uh, the uh, brand name product Zyram Granuflow or Zyram 85W. Uh, the last date for sale of this product from wherever you buy your product from is December 14th, 2020. So the end of this growing season. So the last uh, date for use would be December 14th, 2021. So that's the end of next growing season would be the last date for use for this product. And the crops affected are tomato, uh, various number of cucurbit crops, apples, and peach. Okay, and, and as uh, Gavin had sort of alluded to, uh, Furban hasn't been widely used in the last few years, but it has also been deregistered. De uh, last date of sale is December 14th, 2020. Uh, last date for use is December 14th, 2021. Again, the end of next growing season. So obviously it's a wide range of uses, um, but some of these crops haven't used Furbam in, in quite a few years. So beyond the um, deregistration of products, there's other products that have significant label changes and others that are gonna have label changes coming up. So I wanted to run through a few of those first. So admire the I'm going to talk a little bit about all the products or some of the neonicotinoid products. Um, they and label changes were. Um, pollinator uh, issues. So it be 21 and here's some of the things that are going to be canceled. Uh, so the under that that bef before the new label starts. So as of April 11th, 2021, here's some changes to the admire label. Uh, foliar applications to palm, stone, certain tree knots and that have pollinator attractiveness, lavender and rosemary. Uh, applications, soil applications on uh, legume and cucurbit vegetables, herbs harvested after bloom, small fruit and berries, um, and so on. Uh, and it's done to protect pollinators and do not spray before or during bloom for these crops, fruiting veg, herbs, legume, veg, berry crops. Uh, there's a bit of a, uh, gonna need some clarification on this one, but uh, some requirement to prune woody berries after harvest. I'm not sure what the implications of that are going to be on crops like high bush blueberry. Um, and no application during bloom uh, on uh, either fuller leaf or potatoes, grapes, or legume crops. And so that's just from a pollinate, pollinator protection standpoint. There is another full decision document coming out soon on the full registration of the neonicotinoids, so Admire, Actera, and several others that may further limit these products. Uh, but right now, this is, this is what we have um, coming up for next growing season. Uh, the other one is Actera, and it's gonna it has very similar, um, very similar uh, restrictions to Admire. Uh, the last date for sale under the current label is April 11, 2020. So for foliar and soil applications to ornamental crops that are attractive to pollinators, soil applications to berry crops, cucurbits, fruiting veg, and foliar to orchard trees. It's not gonna be allowed after April 11th, 2020. Um, it's not to be sprayed during, uh, before or during bloom on foliar legume and outdoor fruiting veg, or foliar to berry crops. Again, with the renovation required for woody berries. That, needs further clarification. Um, and it's not to be sprayed during bloom for sweet potato and potato. So as I've mentioned for all the neonicotinoids, the, the initial phase out are just based on the pollinator assessments. Uh, the full decision documents and phase out periods if, if required are gonna are due in, in the coming year. Uh, the decision documents according to the PMRA were are due in March, but I think uh, way things have happened, that's probably gonna be pushed on a little bit. 
Uh, so another one that's been. Pete, can I ask a? Uh, Pete, can I ask a question about Neonix? Sure. Um, for uh, soil applications, does that include seed treatments, or do you have any insight on what's going to happen with seed treatments for the Neonix? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the you mean uh, pre-treated seed? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's going to, well, I'd have to look into that again to be sure. I, to be honest, I didn't uh, look at the seed treatment. That there is going to be restrictions on those for sure. So I, I don't know the specifics. Yeah, thanks. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the concern with some of those uh, seed treatments, um, or with all neonicotinoids, some of them may actually may be removed from market, but um, we'll have to see how the final decision document comes out. Uh, regarding CAPTAN, uh, there are some formulation changes. Uh, the Maestro ADDF and the CAPTAN ADWDG are being phased out, and that has to do partly with what uh, uh, Gavin had mentioned earlier about um, interaction with the applicator. Um, the last date for sale of those products is spring 2020. The last date for use is May 2021 for those formulations. The, the new formulation of CAPDAN is going to be in the water soluble pouches. Excuse me. And the Maestro 80 is already ready for use. And it does have some new rates, some new re enter intervals, and new PHIs for the new formulation. Essentially, it's in the water soluble pouch. So it will have continued use pattern, uses. Um, and then we're awaiting final decision documents on a couple um, fairly vital products, the Matador and Imidan. Um, we don't know the, uh, what those final decisions are, but there is some concern that uh, one or both of these might have significant reduction of uh, uses. And again, those are due earlier this year, or later this year, sorry. So, I just went through a whole bunch of information really fast, but it's the, the one thing I like to recommend everybody is always look at the, the products you're going to be using each year and look at the labels as, as Gavin had gone through. Here's the, the web link again on the PMRI website to look at what those label changes are and what, what's happening in, in the current year. That's what the, this is what that um, web page looks like. You, you, in the searchful contents of e-labels box there, you just type in the name either of the active ingredient or the, or the product name. I will mention that spelling is critical on this. So if you have it spelled wrong, you're not gonna get it. You're not gonna get the right search, but it has every Product registered in Canada. Yeah, so that's uh, that's a, that are that are registered. Uh, way too many to mention in a fifteen minute present. are going to be uh, live very soon. So uh, time for some questions now. If anybody's interested. I'm not seeing any questions coming in, uh, Pete. Um, your audio broke up a little bit there. I don't know if anybody wanted anything repeated. I can certainly do that. No one's asking for that. Um, okay, great. Um, well, thanks very much everybody for attending. Um, oh, hang on, we do have a question. Um, uh, someone's asking if a specific AI is deregistered and I'll just, I'll just answer that. Yes, it's, a, it's the AI that's registered. We talk in trade names a lot, but it's the actual active ingredient that is deregistered. Um, yeah, so thank you uh, everybody for attending. If you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to email um, well, at any of the panelists, Peter, Gavin, Angela, or myself, 
or uh, any of your favorite veg or any of your favorite perennial specialists. Um, so if this all goes well, you're, you should be recorded as attending and we'll report that to the Department of Environment so you get your pesticide credits. Uh, and don't forget to submit your receipts um, when you renew. So thanks very much, everybody, and uh, please enjoy this beautiful spring day.